Hello grade 12s and welcome to this lesson on inverse functions. We start by defining an inverse function. An inverse of a function is the result that we get when we undo a function. That is if we want to get back at where we started. To go back, we interchange the x and y values. What was x becomes y and what was y becomes x. The inverse of a function is the set of ordered pairs obtained by interchanging the first and second elements of each pair in the original function. An inverse of a function is a reflection in the line x is equal to y, where a and b are interchanged into b and a. In a situation where we have a point 4, 3, its inverse will be at 3, 4. Now once we get the points, it becomes easier to interpret or sketch the whole graph. Let us join Karen as she teaches inverse of a function to her learners. Welcome. You're just in time to help me with this demonstration. Hi there. What's this? I thought that we were working on mathematics. This looks more like science or technology. Mm. Now, I know this appears to be more like a science demonstration, but when we're done, you'll see how this is a very valuable tool when explaining concepts in mathematics. I'm ready to be convinced. So am I. Great. What I have here is a multimeter and a battery. The multimeter is turned on. Now, what I want you to do is connect the wires of the multimeter to the battery. OK. I think you can do that. Let's see what happens. Like this. Cool, it's getting a reading. How does that happen? Well, the multimeter needs electrical energy in order for a reading to appear. The battery provides the circuit with that electrical energy. So far, so good. I understand that. Now I'm going to use the battery for another application. What I have here is a toy motor. Now, Tsubohu, I want you to connect the battery to the toy motor just as we did with the multimeter. Okay. okay. So connect that the right. same way that you did before. Like Others, this. that's right. To yeah. the positive. Hey, look, the motor turns pretty fast too. Please explain what's going on. Well, the same way as the battery provided electrical energy to the multimeter, it's doing the same thing for the motor. The input is electrical energy, and in this case with the motor, the output is motion, which is kinetic energy. That's pretty basic. I'm not surprised yet. Patience, Indiswa. I've got a surprise for you. Please, you take the motor. Tsubohu, let's remove the battery, and what we're going to do this time is connect it to the multimeter. Now you've got me confused. How can you expect a multimeter to make a motor work, or a motor make a multimeter work? Is this a kind of a magic show? No, it's not a magic show. Let me show you. I do have a surprise for you. Sindiswa, now what I want you to do is to turn the propellers of the motor, and then we're going to look at the multimeter like we did last time, and let's see what happens. Turn it like Please this. Please turn them, correct. Which is giving us a reading. Oh, wow, that's so cool. We're getting a reading without a battery. Didn't I tell you there'd be a surprise? Hmm. That's exactly what I wanted you to see. You see, what we are doing, we are supplying kinetic energy to the motor, and that is producing electrical energy in order to display a reading on the multimeter. Okay, guys, I'm going to summarize what we've done here using this diagram. Now, in the first instance, we used electrical energy from a battery to supply electrical energy for the motor, which caused the propeller to turn. So the input is electrical energy into the motor, and the output is motion, which is kinetic energy. But when you supplied kinetic energy to the motor by turning the propeller, electrical energy was produced. In this case, the input was kinetic energy, and the output was electrical energy. You're quite right, Sipoho. The opposite has happened. The output in the first situation becomes the input in the second situation as it causes the motor to produce electrical energy. The output in the second situation is the input in the first situation. So what the demonstration illustrates is that there can be a machine that works in one direction, taking input and producing output. However, the operation can be reversed, pushing the output back in. Can you guys think of experiences in your own life where you sometimes want to undo what you have done? How about taking off my shoes after putting them on? Sure, that works. There's locking a door and unlocking it again. What if someone breaks a glass? I mean, you can't undo breaking a glass after it has been broken. That would indeed be hard to undo. 
Now, I'm sure that we can think of many situations in our day-to-day -day lives where there are actions that we did earlier that we can undo. However, as Tabojo pointed out, there are certain actions we did earlier that we cannot undo. Likewise, in mathematics, there are certain actions that we want to undo. In this series, we have been talking about functions. We refer to a function that undoes the action of another function as an inverse function. Cindy, why don't you stand with Tsubokho while I summarize what we have done using this diagram. Here we can clearly see the input of our function f of x. And here we have the output of the function. If there's another function that can take the output from the first function as its input and produce as its output the input of the first function, then we refer to the second function as the inverse function of the original function. Now we denote this inverse of f of x as f negative 1 of x. Okay guys, so should we have a look at a few fairly straightforward inverse functions before we do the more complex ones? I'm keen. Let's go for it. Okay. So here, here we have a simple flow diagram. A number goes into this box. We act on it as instructed on the box and here we write the output. Let's do a specific example. Let the input be the number 10. I guess, since the box tells us that we must double the input value and 20 is double 10, we must write 20 there. That's correct. And what about the rest? Well, double 15 is 30, so we write 30 next to the second line, and carrying on in the same way, we write 54 next to the third line, because that is double 27. <laughs> and 250 next to the last line because 250 is double 125. Job well done, guys. Have a look here. Remember that the inverse function takes the output of the function, acts on it, and produces the input value of the original function as its output. Now we can complete our diagram. The way I understand it is that if this output of 20 from the function is used as an input to the inverse function, then the action of the inverse function on this value would be to produce the original input, namely 10. Can you complete the rest of the table? Let me give it a try. We would expect that if we act on 30 using the inverse function, then we should get the output 15. Similarly, when we act on 54 using the inverse function, we should expect to get the output 27. You really are doing very well, and you're getting a good idea of how an inverse function should act. However, rather than continuing, let's start thinking about what the inverse function is actually doing. In other words, what operation is the inverse function performing to undo what the original function did? Okay, I'll retrace my calculation. The function machine took 10 and doubled it to generate 20. The inverse function undoes what the function does, so it takes 20, halves it, and it gets back to 10. Since the inverse function does the same for all the inputs, we can say that the inverse function is halving the input values. Doing very well, Sindiswa. Why not test the theory by using the outputs of the original function as inputs of the inverse function and then comparing the outputs with the values that we know we should be getting? So what you were saying is that if we take 130 and act on it with the inverse function, meaning we half it, then we'll get 65 and that is just what we expected. Okay, so here's another simple flow diagram. Have a look. In this case, the function simply adds 5 to the input value. Sindiswa, if the input value is 10, what happens? If the input value is 10 and the box tells us to add 5, 10 plus 5 is 15, so write 15 there. And 15 plus 5 is 20, so it's 20 there. The next one would be 32. 
27 plus 5 equals 32, and so on. Good job. Now remember that the inverse function takes the output of the function, acts on it, and produces the input value of the original function as its output. Tebs, why don't you try the rest? We would expect that if we act on 20 using the inverse function, then we should get an output of 15. I think that'll work. Why not test your idea by subtracting 5 from the remaining inputs to the inverse function and then comparing the outputs with the values that we know we should be getting? So what you're saying is if we take 70, act on it with the inverse function by subtracting 5, then we get 65. And that's what we expected. Let me try 105. Subtracting 5 gives 100. Also expected. So the inverse of adding 5 is subtracting 5, making perfect sense. To undo adding 5, we would obviously need to subtract 5. Excellent, well done. An inverse is a function that undoes the work of the function. The inverse of the function that doubles a value is a function that halves a value. The inverse of a function that adds 5 to a value is the function that subtracts 5 from a value. Very often, what we need to do to undo the function is quite obvious, so finding the inverse is easy. For example, if the function multiplied every input by 4, what would the inverse have to do? And if the function subtracted 102 from every input, what would the inverse function have to do? Now I hope that you understand how an inverse function undoes the work of the function and how some of these inverse functions are quite obvious. Let's have a look at another example. Here is another flow diagram. Where the function squares the input value. Sindiswa, why don't you have a go at this? Um, our input value is minus 2. The box tells us that we need to square it. So minus 2 would be 4. Good, keep going. 2 would then be squared, and that would be 4. Minus 3 would be squared, and that would be 9. That's it. Good job. Once again, let me remind you that the inverse function takes the output of the function, acts on it, and produces the input value of the original function as its output. We've already seen how the inverse of the function that doubles a value is a function that halves a value. And the inverse of the function that adds 5 to a value is the function that subtracts 5 from a value. This tells us that if the function squares a value and the inverse function undoes that action, then the inverse function must undo the squaring. It's time to test your theory. Okay. On this first line, I put minus 2 into the function and it produces minus 2 times minus 2, which is 4. Now, the inverse function acts on 4 to produce the original input value of minus 2. Very good. I'm not saying anything, you just continue. Fine. Now for the second line. I put 2 into the function and it produces 2 times 2, which is 4. So the inverse function acts on 4 to produce the original input value of 2. Hang on a minute, Saboho. Is something wrong? Consider this. Let us forget about the function for a minute and concentrate on the inverse function. Before we go on, let me remind you of our definition of a function from our earlier lessons. We stated that a function is a pairing which assigns to each element of the domain a unique element of the range. Now here we have a small problem. Tsuboho, you said with great confidence that when the inverse function acts on 4, it produces minus 2 as the output value. And I said that because the 4 was the result of the squaring minus 2, the inverse should produce minus 2. And then you said in the next line that when the inverse function acts on 4, it produces 2 as the output value. I'm confused. Where's the problem? I wrote down 2 because I looked at the input to the original function. But when I look at the inverse function by itself, I see what you mean. You are saying that we can't have a function that takes in 4 and produces minus 2 on one occasion and 2 on another. 
Yes, we have two problems. First, the idea that the inverse can act on one number on one occasion and produce one value for the output, and then act on the same number in another occasion and produce a different number in the output. This simply contradicts the requirements of the unique elements in the range. I understand that. And of course, how would the inverse know which output we want and when? Correct. And I presume the other problem is what is the inverse of squaring? That is a question that we will investigate in a future lesson. For the moment, I hope that you have developed a sense of what an inverse function is. Join us for the next few lessons where we will be exploring the inverses of various functions. Thank you for joining us, Grade 12s. Remember to look at the tasks for this section in the Functions and Inverses Task video. You'll also be able to learn more about functions on our website. That's www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Until then, goodbye.